So in all of the case, in all cases, alpha will be equal to one minus the confidence interval. And if it's a two-tailed thing, then later on you'll be doing alpha divided by two. All of this right here is giving you the probability of what goes in the tail, in the tail of the curve. Okay, so let's start with, we have uh, this thing here, which is our sample that we drew from our population. You remember we have X bar, we have S, uh, we have uh, P hat, you recall that? And we have variance, which is the square of this, that's all. But this is on the sample space. In the population space, we have mu, what else? Sigma? We have the true P, right? So let me say yeah. So all of these are par called parameters. They're these called population, I mean the group of them, of these guys, are called population parameters. I'm sure you know by now. It's true, right? But now I'm going to use these guys to put a interval to capture God's truth with a certain probability. You know, these are best predictors this way, right? So the one that's in the test, the one that we got in the final, is in particular, it's going to talk about forming a confidence interval for this, uh, this guy. We're always doing it around this. So this will be surrounded by plus x bar, I mean x bar minus an error term and x bar plus an error term. That error term is where the probability comes in, depending on what, you know, when you, when you do your histogram, you start to estimate what the true, you know, once you settle on that, then you can start filling in your error term. You see how it ties together? No? Okay. So let's do the one that's on the test. Um, if you got your test, uh, it's the one that's going to have this thing here. Uh, it's asked for the confidence interval. So we have like S squared times N minus 1. This is the confidence interval for the population deviation or variance. So it's going to be, listen, here we put what we don't know, that's God's truth. The square means variance, but the square root would be no big deal, right? And this is N minus 1, and then this is going to be S squared. Uh, no, this is going to be a confidence interval for the variance or the deviation. So number uh, Sorry, 24. Read that out. Number 24. Find the standard deviation of a wooden dial. A manufacturer measure 19. No, that's not a confidence interval, is it? Yeah, it is. Find a 95% confidence interval for the population standard deviation sigma. Okay. So I'll give you that back. So let's do that problem right there. Uh, that's 21. 24, and that one's going to be, um, so what was it, what is N? Oh, by the way, I didn't finish this. This has to be, this is going to be chi squared. I call it the bigger number. And this is going to be chi squared, which we haven't done yet. It's a distribution. I'm going to call this a small number. And then we're going to have, what I always do, right? I put the probability that God's truth is contained here. The probability is the confidence interval. It's 0.95 in this question. And what is n? Can somebody read it to me? What is it? 19. Okay. And one thing that we have to know that you may not know yet was called degrees of freedom. That's degrees of freedom. And it always equals to n minus 1, which is really that. If you know, if I cover this up, they're identical. Look n minus 1 s squared, n minus 1 s squared. The only difference is the size of the numbers you're dividing by. So now we have n minus 1, and then uh, what is, uh, what was my, is it, they give you s? Yeah, s is 0 0.16. 0 0.16, is that s squared or s? That's just s. Okay. All right, so now we're kind of, first we're going to do up here what alpha is. Alpha is 1 minus the confidence interval. Right, so that means alpha divided by 2 is going to be equal to 0 0.025. Do you see that? Because this is 0 0.05. This is equal to 
0 0.05, so half of that is 0 0.025. And this is what a chi-squared looks like, kind of. It's not symmetrical, it's like this. And what stretches it in and out will be these degrees of freedom. So, in this case, I still, just like the other ones, I have to go, and in here I'm going to put 0 0.025. Or better yet, let me make it bigger so I can put it in there. Okay, so I want to put point zero two five in this tail. And on this tail over here, I gotta put point zero two five. Now, if we have been a bell curve or symmetric, once we get this Z number, you got this one. But not in this case, because it's not symmetrical. So now we have to go to the table. Uh, chi square chi square table back. I thought I had it here. Uh, normal T distribution. Oh, okay. I thought I had it saved. So this is how you spell chi, like that. Uh, chi square distribution. Uh, here's the different types of, see how it's skewed? And how it's skewed, it depends on your degrees of uh, freedom. And, um, the actual uh, table. But if you look at, see how this tail is filled out? You can see that this, they're the same area, but it's squashed and stretched differently. But this values will be different, because it's not. Okay. I don't know if you can see the numbers, but in your book it's 789, I think, page 789. So, if you take a look right here, remember the table's filling up from left to right. So if you look at right here is your degrees of freedom. See the degrees of freedom? Go to 19. Okay, because degrees of freedom are 19, is it? Or 18? N minus 1, right? What is N? So N the degrees of freedom is 18. Okay, and now what I want you to do is, let me see if I can. I want you to go across from 18, and right here, you're going to see 0 0.025. That's what's on the tail on this side. So all you have to do is subtract 1 from n, 18, and then keep going back until we get to the 0.25. So we have 31.53. Huh? No, uh -uh, it's in your book. Yeah, you can use your book. Um, you can use whatever you want, except another person. All right, now, take a look at this. If I'm saying that if you put 0 0.025 here, right, that's probability. Everything under the curve is always positive, less than one, or equal. This right here, the chi value right here is gonna be 31.53. To find this guy, you know that also 0 0.025 is in there, right? But you have to calculate the probability from left to right. So I need to know, can somebody tell me how much probability is from here all the way back to minus infinity? That's right. Look, you got 0 0.025, right? Right there? But you know the whole thing adds the one, right? So you just take one and subtract 0 0.025. And we'll be left with what? 0.975. You see that? I take whatever area is here, I subtract, because the total area I know is 1. The reason I need to get this number, this I already got, right? I looked up 0.025, correct? correct? So now we have to go back to the table to 18, but this time go to the 0.975. And in that case, on the same row, that I got, what, this one, 8.23? Yeah, yeah, and then we go back to um, what I was doing here, I think. Yeah, so here, under this guy, we're gonna put, what was it, 31? Is it 31 something? And on this one, I'm gonna eight something. And that's how you're gonna do it. 
So in order to calculate it, we now have the bigger number here, the smaller number here, that'll change the value here. This is going to be a smaller number than this number, because this is a bigger chi-square. So what in effect you're going to actually be calculating is the interval is going to be 18, right? And then um, times 0.16 squared, you see it? And that's going to be over 31.53. And that's going to be less than sigma squared. And that's going to be less than n minus 1. Oops, sorry, let me just get rid of that because I already got my numbers. And that will be equal to uh, the same numbers. 18 times 0.16 squared, see, that's 18, and then s squared is 0.16, s is 0.16, okay, but this one you have to, you're going to take this and multiply it times that, so you can just multiply this one together, that's 0.16, which is the same as numbers this, but this one you're going to divide by 3, and then you're going to say that will have a confidence interval of 95%. Wait, are the lower numbers squared? What? Are the lower numbers squared? Is that 8.3? Oh, I see what you mean. No, that's not the symbol for chi square. That's the name of the distribution. Yeah. Okay, so whatever number that comes out to be. That's not a, you know, but they were asking about the confidence interval, about not the variance, but the uh, deviation, right? So that means that whatever number that comes out to be. 0 0.4608. 0.4608. Oh, what is that in here? Six less than sigma squared, and this other one. Uh, let's see, something happened wrong. Because this, oh, you did. How does the point nine five? How does what? How do you use the point nine five? We use it to get alpha. Remember, alpha is one minus the confidence interval. Then we divide that two. That tells us how much area is in the curve. Point zero two five. Then we use to find these what are called critical values using the chart. And on one, we got eight some, and the other one, we got 31.53. Well, this is supposed to be point zero. Point zero. Okay, so this is point zero. Yeah. Okay, so in this case, we look like we're pretty good because this is a bigger number than that. However, we're looking for they're asking for not the variance, but the deviation. So the last thing to do is get rid of this. We're going to square root it. And we have to square root this side, and we have to square root this side. And that should be the answer. Because what happens, look, look when you do this, see sigma squared? That means two chains of sigma, right? Here and here, it's chain to chain. And there's a two in a crack. If you don't see it, it means two. So you look for groups for two and it becomes one. So this just becomes sigma. Right? Two point, point two three? Point two three six. All right. And then you bring this probability to that. And that's what they're looking for. That has a 95% chance of containing God's deviation, population deviation. Is there another question that they ask on that problem? Or is that a... No, but that, 95, that point 95 is Right. But what is that? It has to do with these numbers we're dividing by. Okay. You understand the alpha comes in over here. Right. One minus the confidence interval. Then that we put in the table. I just didn't know if you still had to add that at the very, very end of the equation. That's the answer, how you put the 0.95 standard like it doesn't have that in this. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have the probability. But I'm saying that the, the probability that God's truth is this has written. Right. So you have it written with a point nine five, that's why I'm just asking it. Oh, I see.
Because all along it's been equal to that. Right. So I'm just filling in the numbers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I just want to make sure that if I don't do that, what do wrong? Is no, but you have the answers there. They don't include it. Just answer what's on the test. It'll be okay. All right. It's just, it, it, it leaves it like this without the rest of it. But this is what we're doing, is getting a probabilistic interval at a 90 for, that, that, to me it doesn't make sense unless it's written up there, but you can write, just answer whatever's there. Any questions on that problem? Any questions on that problem? No? Okay. Let's go to the next. Um, problem one, did we do that already? Yeah. Okay. No, we don't have to do that. Uh, did we do all at once to say chapter four on there? Four? Right, yeah, but I was asking him here because I know you've seen it before, you're a veteran. But, uh, okay, well, if I did all four, let's go on to uh, uh, chapter eight, I guess. Uh, on five, I think there was a question on chapter five there. In any other chapter, any did four? Did you do number six, which is the chapter four? We did not. Not that one. All right, let's do six real quickly. And don't have my hands. Oh, so the ID. That is a chapter, yes. Yeah, see, you found some information. I don't have that on Okay, so uh, I don't know if you know this. This is. United States. Oops. That's chapter four. And then this is the Mississippi River. All radio stations on the East Coast have to start with a W on their call letter. And everything on the West Coast starts with K. Okay? If you read that problem, what does it say? It says it says one of these two letters followed by two more letters, or another letter followed by three more. Did you hear the word or? So now we're going to be doing some, some probability. So let's do the first one. So we got how many places? Well, one, we have the call letter and then two more spots, right? And the other one, we have a call letter and we got three spots. That's what it's saying. It's either got this many or this many. Now, how many ways can we fill the first box? How many ways can we fill the first box? Yeah, it can only be one of these guys. Yeah, it's better be two. Because the first letter has to be either K or W. Now this is a tough one, but since we have replacement domain, we don't we don't have to worry about um, not replacement. So how many letters in the alphabet? That's the big. Well, then we better go back to the right school. So, these are nothing but a kind of accounting rule. So, but or means I'm going to add them together eventually. So, if you'll multiply 2 times 26 times 26, uh, you'll have that number. It's about, what, 1300 or something? I don't know. Yeah, this is a 525 twice. 1050. Somebody want to do this? This is 26. This is 26, too. So we're adding them? Mm -hmm. No, you got to multiply them. You add the two together, you multiply the first one, and then the second one. Yeah, this all means when you do multiplication for the counting rule, that's the basic, the most basic rule of all. If you don't have replacement, let's suppose you had a briefcase and it had three tumblers, right? And it goes from zero to nine, so that's 10 ways, and this is 10 ways, and this is 10 ways. That's the fundamental counting rule. So it's 36,504. You added both of them? Yes. Well, what's this one? The first one is 1,352. 52? Yeah. And this one? 35,152. 152? Okay, then you're just going to add them. 35,152 plus the other count. Uh, right, and then you get the answer there that says 36. 
So, our number nine. Um, let's do nine. This one was, uh, what was this? Six. Yeah, that was number six. Huh? All right, so if you, does everybody have it? Okay. Number two? What's number two? Okay, that's coming. All right. So you wanted which one? Nine? Okay, so nine is really asking whether the event is independent or not. That's all. So uh, what is the sample size? 1,232? I can't hear with his fans, that's why. Yeah. Okay, and how many had high blood pressure? So if I create a ratio of 397 over 1, 2, 3, 2, right? That's the chances of anybody coming in and having high blood pressure. So this guy comes in, he's picked at random, and has found that he has his high blood pressure. See? Okay, now the question is, what about the next person? So now we have a woman, let's say, comes in. And they're going to test her blood. What are the chances that she has high blood pressure? Is that what this equals? Yeah. So this equals 0.32. And because it's an independent event, the guy, the fact that they have, that this guy has high blood pressure doesn't mean anything to the next. So the answer is 397 over 1, 2, 3, 2 which is 0.32, or you can call it 32%. And that's it for that one. Are we okay? So the answer is, it's the same chance of getting high blood pressure with the next person. That's our best estimate of it. Thirteen. Here is another binomial problem because what we have is that people who graduate, I think 65% of them are uh, get a job in their field within the first year. Got that? So I know either they got a job or they didn't. That's why I'm lending myself to why I'm thinking it's binomial. So you know we have P uh, for success and the success in this case means you get a job within the first year, right? Is that 65%? Yeah. So now, can you tell me what Q is? 35. That's right, because Q is always equal to 1 well, minus P. I got that. <laughs> so this is 0.35. It should. <laughs> so what is the sample size? Seven? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. So, um, let's try it. And uh, what is it they want to know? What's the probability of what? It says find the probability that 11 random selectees graduates all time jobs and have chosen field within a year of graduating. Okay, so what we want to know, what is the probability that the random variable X is going to be equal to 11 of them got jobs? You see that? And that's going to be equal to the combination rule of n choose x, p raised to the x, and q raised to the n minus x. That's the equation for finding exactly one thing. Now, I'm thinking this thing ought to come out to be 1, because these are the number of successes, right? So if we put it in, what we have is n is over here, right, 11? And then x is going to be equal to 11 again. And p means no successes, right? Or I mean all successes, sorry. 11. And failures to get a job, 0. You understand? So what is q to the 0? 1. Anything raised to the 0 is 1. Got it? So, and then P is 0.65, well, there it is already, to the 11. So, what I got is 11 factorial 
divided by 11 factorial, n minus x, uh, n minus x is zero factorial, isn't it? This minus that. Or, and what I'm trying to say is that this n x is equal to, you got n factorial over n minus x factorial divided by x factorial. You see that? Now, so I've got it reversed here, but n minus x is 11 minus 11. That's a zero factorial, and then you have 11 factorial. Which is split. So you can see that 11 factorial is going to divide out and be 1. Uh, well, there is no answer here. I don't know what you're thinking. What's zero factorial? Okay, so it's just as we predicted, this whole thing goes to 1. No, this whole thing goes to 1, So, and this goes to 1. So the answer is 0.65 raised to the 11th. It's going to be pretty small, I think. Um, okay, okay. 0.00875. Okay. They rounded up. Then, uh, all right, now I'm going to add this to the test. This will be added. For the next question, there'll be a part two that I'm going to add, okay? And it's going to be find the probability that the random variable x is at least or equal to one. That means at least one. That means one or more. So you would have to do this equation for one or more. Well, that'd be one or two or three or four or five, all the way up to 11, right? So one method is that you could say, okay, if I get just one, I have to go through all my calculations using that equation to calculate one. Then it could have or two. Do you see it? And you have to do this all the way dot, 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 till you get to the probability that we just finished, that all of them got jobs. Okay, these are the different possibilities, one or more. So how many times are you gonna to have to use this equation? Well, it looks like about 10 times. But you can do it once, is what I'm getting at. So if you wanna do it that way and spend time, that's okay. But I would suggest this, that the probability that at least one is equal to one minus the probability that nobody got a job in the first year. Are you getting it? So now all I have to calculate is this guy, instead of adding all those up. So, I'm going to figure out what this guy is. Well, this is little x is zero, right? So using that same equation, I'm going to have c, right? But n, n is 11, right? Yes? And, and x, in this case, big X is equal to little zero, right? So it's zero. You see it? And the probability of success is 0.65, right? But this says we have no successes. Yeah, and so here we have 0.35 raised to the what? What's n minus x? can't have a negative power on that probably. Could you? Yeah, you could. Just look what it is. What's n and what's x? What's n here? 11. What's x? So what's 11 minus 0? I don't know. What number are you coming up with? Now, what, where does this come into count, this counting rule? Here we were talking about we had 11 successes. Right? All of them got jobs. We calculated the probability, so I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now, how many ways can we organize 11 successes? 11 ways? Huh? I didn't hear you. It's 11 ways. How many ways? 11. No. How many ways can I get different order out of here? No, there's only one way. There it is. Order doesn't matter. All right, we're in a combination rule. That's it. You can't organize successes any other way. They're all, all successes. And what about this guy? Now we have all failures. 
And each one of these cha-ching, cha-ching would be multiplication rule because it's additive, I mean, uh, and. So we got a bunch of these, right? How many ways can you organize all figures? One way. Is it true? This better come out to be one. Because this is 11 factorial, that's what goes on top. And this is n minus x, which is another 11 factorial, right? And then divide by x factorial, which is 0 factorial. Well, that equals to 1, you divide out to 1, and 0 factorial equals 1. So it's true. All of this thing, for none, and for no successes and all successes, this guy better come out to be 1. And the answer to this one is going to be equal to 0.35 raised to the 11th power. So it's, it's pretty rare that nobody would get a job. Anybody? 965. So you can see it's very low probability that nobody gets a job in the first year. Five zeros. Okay? But that's not what I'm asking. I'm, I'm asking what's the probability that at least one? So we have to take one minus that. It's almost 100% that at least one will get a job. You understand what I mean? Okay. That was the same thing we did on problem number one. If you, if you, if you uh, do the same thing on number one, it was asking you, well, what's the probability of what was 11? What was on, uh, none of them. They're asking you none of them had whatever it was. What was number one? Let me do it quickly here. Yeah, I know. But I was going to reinforce it. Okay. Uh, what, what, what was the success there? What's, this is number one. What's the probability of success? What is it? What is it? Huh? Oh, okay, now I remember. Okay, so we have a test question that you're going to guess on. Okay, this is a multiple choice, but each one has an A, B, C, D, and E. So there are five of them. Okay? And I asked you, what's the chances of picking one of these? It's one out of five. Which one goes in the box, you divide it by five, decimal here, decimal here, it's 0.2. So, what's Q? Well, it's 1 minus P. What's that? 0 0.80, okay? Now, it's going to ask the question. It's asking, what is the chances that you guess on all seven and you get none of them right? Would you expect that to be high or low? Low. Low. Okay, so what I'm saying is that what is the probability that the random variable capital X takes on a value of none. You guess none of the seven right. Okay? Number one. So here we have, again, combination rule. What is n? Seven. Okay, so there you have seven. Choose none. And then you have point two raised to the zero because you have no successes. And then you have 0.8, and that's raised to the 7, n minus x. And that's what you would get. That's the probability of getting none. Now, since I'm talking about 7 failures, how many ways can we organize 7 failures? 1. So this better come out to be 1. The next one is 1, 2. This is raised to the 0, so it's 1. So the answer is 0.80 raised to the 7. 0 0.21. Point oh, 0 doesn't matter. Point 0.21. Okay, so there's a 21% chance is all of, even if you wanted to, of not get 21% chance that you couldn't get any of them right. Guessing. So what I'm going to add to the problem is that the probability of, what is the probability that at least one? Well, that's going to be 1 minus the probability of none. Correct? That's the shortcut. So here we have 1 minus 0.21. So what is that, 0.79? You have a 79% chance 
of getting at least one. Right. See, you can use that for gamma. All right. I'm going to add this part, at least one. But you've already calculated none here. Correct? All right. Let me just show you, because um, we've been doing extreme examples. But suppose I want to know what is the probability that x equals 2 correct? What is the probability that you get two of them correct? Well, so that means that's little x now is 2. So we have c. n is 7, correct? 2 is, I want to know what is the probability of guessing two of them correctly. Then what is the probability of guessing correctly? 0 0.20 raised to the amount that we got correct, which is two of them. And the other one's all about failure. 0 0.8 raised to the 7 minus 2. 5. Okay, now, this is 7 choose 2. How many ways can we take seven people and organize packages of two? So what we're doing is, look what we have here. This is saying, in effect, that we have a success, success, and then we have failure, another failure, another failure, another failure. Uh, right, so there's going to be seven of them total. Right? You see that? If that means two successes, because I'm asking what's exactly two successes, 0.2 raised to the 2 and 0.5 raised to the 0.8. Now, this better not be 1. Why? How many ways can I distribute S among these seven? Right? Another one example would be this, and then failure, and failure, and failure, and failure, and then success. That's why I need this counting rule. That's going to tell us how many ways that can be scrambled. We've had the special circumstances if they're all or none. So this had to be equal to one. But not now. In this case, we're going to have, in this case, n factorial is seven. You see that? And then I'm going to divide by n minus x. That's seven minus two. That's five factorial. And then I have to divide by x, which is two factorial. Do you see that? And then I have how many successes? I'm looking for two successes. So P will be raised to the two. Now I have my failures, and we all know that there are seven, right? So what's left here is the five, correct? Okay, now let's see what this means right here. Do you see that this means seven times five times four times three all the way down? And this means five times four times three all the way down? Yeah? So if I divide it out, what's left on top? 7 times 6, right? Because the 5 factorial will divide out with a tail. And what is 2 factorial? Well, it's 2 times 1, right? Which is 2. And 2 goes into 6 3 times. So, the answer, there are 21 ways we can organize this. That's why we needed our counting rule. Right? So what's the probability? The probability will be equal to 21 times 0 0.20 raised to the, sorry, 2 times 0 0.80 raised to the 5. That's, that'll be the answer. I'm just showing you a case where n is not either 0 or all of them. Then when the counting rule does step in. Because otherwise, you'd have to try to figure it out by hand. There'd be 21 different ways. Okay. I think we can go to chapter 8 now. Unless there's anything else on there. Okay, let's finish the four. Number 15 says the six-sided die is rolled. Find P, which is three or five. Ah, did you hear the word or? That means add. Add. Or is add and add. So, what's the chances of getting uh, what? The six-sided die is rolled. Find P, which is three or five. Okay, what's the chance of getting a three? Yeah, 50%. No, not on a dice. Yeah. 36. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> is this the Magic the Gathering? Or is it, does it have an extra rule? rule? And what now? Are, is it, are they mutually exclusive? Does one of they over? They don't overlap, do they? So what is it getting a one six? One six. Can we add one six plus one six? What is it? 
Do you see it, Austin? Am I got the right name, Austin? Do you see that this thing, when you have a common denominator, you don't even have to use the nodes. Just carry that over and add the top. And that will equal to one third, which is the answer. You can see it's actually, some questions are really easy. But you have to know about add or multiply. You have to know about counter. Number 17. Number 17. That's clear. We have an issue of possible places being contaminated, water being contaminated, right? Wells or something like that. Um, swimming, pools. swimming pools. Okay. How many swimming pools? And equals six. Uh, then, um, okay, so do we have, what's the, what's the chances of a success, meaning that it's contaminated? It's either contaminated or it's not. 0 0.003. Uh, do me the favor and don't read the zero in front of the decimal. It's like saying zero dollars and 32 cents. It's just easier to get a point, you know. The zero in front is unnecessary. So what is Q? 1 minus P. So 5. Oh no! Can't be fairer than 1. Oh my god. I want to know what 1. 0.997. Yep. 9.97. Because Q is always <laughs> equal to 1 minus P. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Weird math. Okay, so either you have a failure or a success. It's either, our failure is a contamination. I mean, our success is a contamination. So, what I really want to know is what's the probability that at least one of them is contaminated? Well, if it's very small, then we don't need to spend more money testing others. Exactly. And that's what it's asking. Is it, should we test or not? So what is the equation for the binomial? I mean, yeah, binomial is, right, C, N, choose X. Success raised to the X successes. And if that's success, obviously failures are going to be N minus X. It should be making more and more sense. So now we know we have at least one, but we have a total of six. So you would have to do this for one, two, three, four, everything but none. So the, yeah, so the shortcut will be what he's saying. Take one minus the probability that the random variable x is equal to zero. That will tell you the probability of at least one. So this is a problem because we can't even do it. We don't know how, really, we don't know how to do it with this inequality. But we know how to do this. So this is what I, let me scratch this out because this is the answer I want to this. But first I have to calculate what's the chances that none of them are contaminated. Well, if none of them are contaminated, right, we're going to have C. N is 6. And this is the number of contaminated, the random variable came up to be zero this time. And P, we already know what P is, right? It's 0 .003, but it was all failures, correct? So this is raised to the zero. And then we have 0.997. Well, it's N minus X, so they're all failures. So it's this. Now, we should understand that this is going to be one, right? Because you have six failures. There's only one way to organize six failures. When order doesn't matter. And even if it did, I don't know if it yeah, did, yeah. Okay, you understand? So the answer to this problem, the answer to the probability that the random variable is equal to zero is this. So really, the end result's going to be, this is one, isn't it? That's raised because it's raised to the zero. This is going to be 6 factorial divided by n minus x, which is 6 factorial divided by 0 factorial. Well, that's equal to 1, because 0 factorial is equal to 1. Are we okay? So the answer is going to be 0 0.997 raised to the 6, which is real close to 1. 0 0.92. 0 0.92? Okay, so then the problem... Oh, 
That's right. So to find at least one, that means at least one well is contaminated, that's going to be equal to 1 minus 0.932. And the answer is 0.018. So that's a 1% chance, almost 2% chance. So it might not justify the expense to test all the rest of the wells if you have such a low probability that at least one, one or more, there it is. Over the Christmas, I mean, over Thanksgiving holiday, I would just keep going over those problems that you have that you that we solved until you memorize it. Are we okay with this one? Oh, that means we have time. All right, then uh, let me go to chapter eight real quick. Okay, this one we did already. That was the, uh, let's see, this one we did already. So now, 